Hi, and welcome. Um, I'm Tara Needham, and I'm the Assistant Academic Director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. And this is the virtual reading group. Today is uh, kind of a different meeting. Roger has um, given the reins over to me. I feel like I'm filling in like a guest host for a late night TV show. Um, and I'm in my office at the Rent Center. And today we're using this time to kind of pause and uh, collect our thoughts and sort of review and revisit the life of the mind, which I realize we have now all been reading together since I believe July. Um, so a good four and a half or so months in. And I see my role today as primarily a fellow reader and a facilitator. Um, I am also grappling with this text for the first time in, in my reading of Arendt. And so um, I'm kind of with you on this journey. And I'm hoping that today we can talk to each other more that rather than um, sort of seek expertise or you know answers exactly and just try to turn to one another to raise questions, um, revisit ideas and gather thoughts. Um, I just wanna remind you all that I've been a member of the VRG since March of 2020. And you know before I began working here, this was a really special place for me. So it means a lot to be on this side of things and um, hosting you and gathering you today. So um, what I thought we would do is um, I'm going to share uh, a few of my thoughts about the book and they are not going to be sort of chronological necessarily through the text, but I offer them as my experience of reading of pieces that I have felt have allowed me to anchor myself in life of the mind. Um, and then uh, I'm interested in trying a new feature today, which for would be to um, send us into smaller breakout sessions for a short period of time. So this would be where you could, I will put you into groups randomly for about five to 10 minutes. Um, it won't be too long for those who, who are not, uh, you know, fond of this format, but it may offer you all a chance to, first of all, say hello to one another, and then also to maybe speak um, in a smaller group about some of the questions and what interests you about the book. Are there any questions about that? James, I see your hand is up already. Is that a question about the process or a question about the book? Uh, it's a question about process. Okay, please, what's your and, question? And um, I thought this is, this is an ideal situation where I could bring up my, um, ineptitude, my enthusiasm, and the effort that I'm making to read Hannah Arendt. Does this make sense? This makes a lot of sense. And so I hope that um, if we do the breakouts, you can express that. And then when we get back together as a group, this would also be a chance for you to, you know, express to the group, ask us, and we can kind of work, work through just what it is to try to grapple with this text. Before before we go into that, yes, um, my background for the last forty or fifty years is to physicalize um, concepts and make art out of it. So acting, um, painting, drawing, etc. So dancing and um, this. The activity with Hannah Arendt is um, there's a distance. It's more th uh, thinking, uh, conceptual, um, and I'm wondering how to make the the um, transition or the to couple myself with it. My experience is always to 
find a physical uh, uh, manifestation of what I'm reading so that I can then understand it and look at it and take it apart and analyze it. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I mean, I, um, and so again, I hope that, I mean, I think that's one way for us to frame for all of us, just, you know, how are we sort of bodily intellectually making sense of this text? It sounds like for you that there's a sort of translation to performance of some kind to embodiment and that perhaps this text in particular proves to be somewhat challenging. So if you can, if we can have that out in the open for now, I'll okay. make some of my remarks and then you can um, bring that to your small group and then to the larger group. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, any, any other immediate questions? Okay. So, um, I'm just going to speak briefly to kind of remind us about the scope of the text, you know, the life of the mind. Um, so one of the things that allows me to kind of orient myself throughout this text is to return to the questions that Arendt offers us um, in the introduction. And in the introduction, she explains to us kind of two prompts that brought her to embark on this task of the life of the mind. One of them is the experiential um, engagement of the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem. And be, that experience, and that's the one she puts forefront, she says, um, it made me question how thinkers have grappled with the idea of evil. And it raised the question for me of what does it mean to have an evil actor who does not seem to embody wickedness or bad intentions um, or have a kind of um, deformed character, but whose main trait is, as she says, thoughtlessness. Um, that that is what she acknowledged about Eichmann. And this leads her to think about the relationship between the activity of thinking and its consequences or relationships to ethical action. And so she explains that in order to address this question, she has to now turn to um, a very basic question, one of the questions of philosophy. She says it's even a lesser question, but what exactly is thinking? which is, is where, where we land. Um, and the shift she makes there is a little bit harder to follow. And she relies on Kant very heavily, both in the introduction and in the first section appearances of the text. She thinks about some of the great metaphysical thinkers, Aristotle and Plato, um, and she tries to characterize what they were doing because she says, you know, metaphysics as a practice or as a field of philosophy is essentially at her time and in her opinion kind of debunked. She references the idea of metaphysical fallacies, that the worlds or the thought systems that metaphysics has created have um, proven to be sort of incorrect. But she says they stand as a testament to thinking as a form of meaning making. That it's in these systems and in these thought worlds that we find the greatest evidence, if we look for it, of thinking of as an activity that makes meaning as opposed to searches for truth. And that that, that has kind of been the, the error of, of some of these systems is to try to arrive at truth rather than to recognize that it is meaning that is produced. And so I think it's important um, in, in grasping the text and it was for me in reminding myself that she really turns to Kant and Kant's, um, she, she takes up two of his concepts which she finds incredibly useful, his distinction between reason and intellect. And again, this is kind of the review that um, Kant offers her a way to think about these different activities of the mind and that the intellect for Kant 
is related to cognition um, and it is related to the search for knowledge. And it is primarily concerned with objects of the sensory world. And that reason for her kind of interpreting Kant tends to um, deal with those things that are less related to the sensory world, to the world that appears to us. The, work, the questions that are intangible, um, unanswerable, and that what, what is being pursued there in, in her interpretation is meaning. So reason is related to meaning making. Um, and this becomes a crucial distinction for her. And it's one of the ways that I kind of anchor myself in, in the text. And I think Roger reminded us of this again and again. Um, and she even says that Kant himself uh, limited himself when he made these distinctions, right? He says, oh, that reading uh, reason is even, you know, mostly only related to these larger questions of immortality, of freedom, of God. But she says, no, reason actually applies to all um, encounters, all thinking activities in, in our need to reflect. So she's taking that concept and she's expanding it. So that's one of the, the big anchors for me, and I think probably for all of us in the text, um, that it was helpful for me to remind myself of. And so she set herself this task of trying to understand what are we doing when we're thinking? And so one of the other contrasts um, or distinctions that she's trying to make is um, between the kind of inherited ideas, particularly from ancient philosophy, that thinking at its highest form arrives almost at a place of stasis, of stillness, of contemplation. Um, that it anticipates a kind of future paradise. And that for her, there's some tension there, I think, and this is one of my questions, is um, throughout the text, she will describe thinking as an activity, as um, a ceaseless activity, one of, of kind of constant motion, um, that thinking, is like I said, it, it is active. She calls it slippery. It's discursive. And so one of the questions that remains for me is, um, what is what is her relationship between activity, this activity of thinking that she is kind of pointing to again and again, and her idea of action, which needs a public sphere um, so I'm interested in the, the kind of possible connections because they're not the same, but she does want to insist on, on thought itself as a kind of ceaseless activity. She says at some points, it's the very quality of life. It is the quintessence of living. Um, so that's, that's one question that I would, I would pose. Um, just a few more thoughts, because I really do want to let you all do what, what, um, what you do and, and raise your questions. I thought that another important concept that, that she developed, and this was through Descartes, again, in the section one on appearances, was really starting to um, bring to the fore the common sense um, as this sixth sense that kind of gathers all of the information from our five senses. And so again, the common sense is not um, thinking per se, although thinking is involved in it, but the common sense is, is oriented towards and engaged with the phenomenal world. But, it is, but in itself, it conveys a sense of realness. And this is important because you may have noticed that she really takes Descartes to task. She's like, this whole solipsism that I'm just a thinking being isolated, separated from the world, withdrawing completely. She pretty much says that's not possible, that there's always a sense of realness um, and that it is the common sense that imparts that. And so um, again, that vocabulary and that concept becomes important for her moving throughout. 
And I think at the base of all of this, which is another distinction that helps me to stay rooted in the text is, you know, just the basic, um, you know, reminder. And I, I remember as a young philosophy student, just constantly being thrilled by this recognition that, you know, we are embodied beings who have senses, who exist in a world of appearances and phenomena. And then we are also thinking beings and that are sent to kind of separate out our senses as a source of information and knowledge. And that so much of the pursuit of philosophy, philosophy has been this kind of conflict between the senses and, and the mind. And, um, you know, she will call this the two world theory. And sometimes it's the, the objects of the mind that take precedence in the history of thought where it's more important that we're, we're thinking about uh, ideals and concepts. And then other times, um, and she attributes this to modern science, it's much more the senses that dominate as a source for knowledge and truth. And, and she's gonna say that, that that's a metaphysical fallacy, that in order to orient ourselves in the world, we always need to have this sort of gap and sense of both. Um, and that this sort of just tracks back to one of her most um, clear statements at the very beginning of section one. It's very much in line with with a, a sort of phenomenological um, sort of track in philosophy that being equals appearance. Right? She writes that being equals appearance. And you know, what that means is that we, we live in a, a world of phenomena that everyone who can perceive is also perceived. We are all subject and object. Um, and so, and that we depend on that diversity to form a consensus about our world. For me, this was really significant because it links very clearly to her conception of plurality, which is one of our key kind of political concepts from Arendt. And so I really appreciated it, the resonance between what is more of an ontological idea of um, we, we exist in a world of multiple beings and then the idea that that translates into her idea of man as plural and that that plurality also becomes a very key point in her concept of, um, of politics. So I'm just gonna say um, a couple more things uh, and then I'm going to turn it over that um, I just wanted to point to one or two quotes that I found sort of helpful again in my in my rereading. So excuse me one second if you don't mind. Um, Sorry about that. I'm, I'm still learning how to organize all of this. Um, okay. I think it's 58 to 59. It's at the bottom of 58 to 59, where she just states, the questions raised by thinking and which it is in reason's very nature to raise questions of meaning are all unanswerable by common sense and the refinement of it we call science. So this is where she's sort of putting common sense and thinking in relationship to each other. Um, and then on 61, I'm in the middle of a paragraph on 61. To expect truth to come from thinking signifies that we mistake the need to think with the urge to know. Thinking can and must be employed in the attempt to know, 
but in the exercise of this function, it is never itself. It is but the handmaiden of an altogether different enterprise. Um, I guess two other things I just wanted to note was I was really interested in you know, this question of where are we when we are thinking. In the second section of the book, she's really interested in the fact that in order to think, what makes it unique in a world of appearances, if, if being is a p equals appearance, thinking is the, is the very um, thing that requires that we withdraw from the sensory world. This is one of her contentions. And I think one of the things that she finds most kind of paradoxical that in thinking we withdraw from the phenomenal world. Um, and this is when she gets into our ability to remember that thinking allows us to bring to the mind things that are not actually present. Whether that is the past through memory, whether it is images and words, or even whether it is a possible future in willing. And so that, question of um, thoughts, invisibility, and its requirement of withdrawal uh, is, again, interesting to me because it raises this question of its activity versus its passivity. Um, and then finally, you know, when she gets to Socrates and talking about, that's where she more clearly loops back to a question of the relationship between thinking and evil um, and suggests that the kind of discursive quality of thought requires that we be able to kind of sit with ourselves in that conversation. Um, I actually wanna just pull up that quote. Um, this is on 191. Uh, I'm, I'm actually reading, this is after her quote from Richard III, and I'm reading from the end of 190 into 191. Um, success in that comes easy because all he has to do is never start the soundless solitary dialogue we call thinking, never go home and examine things. This is not a matter of wickedness or goodness, as it is not a matter of intelligence or stupidity. A person who does not know that silent intercourse in which we examine what we say and what we do will not mind contradicting himself. And this means he will never be either able or willing to account for what he says or does, nor will he mind committing any crime since he can count on its being forgotten the next moment. So I just offer some attempt to link some of these ideas together in an immense book that, again, she calls thought slippery. And for me, I found it's very hard to hold this book in my mind as kind of a whole. And so um, I, I'm trying to punctuate moments that start to make some sense for me and start to answer the question, why has she persisted so um, carefully in this inquiry? So um, I'm gonna close down my thoughts for now. I, I hope that that allowed you at least to kind of remember some other parts of the book that we've talked about. I have a sense that many of you know this book better than I do, and I'm really looking forward to hearing um, a lot of what you have to offer. So unless there's any um, great, resistance, I thought what I would do is um, throw you out into the ether into some breakout groups. Say, hey, Tara, yeah. uh, I'd like, like to interrupt. I think five or 10 minutes isn't enough. By the time we introduce ourselves, we're already at the limit. 
That's wonderful. I wanted to judge how much interest there was because sometimes people end up in a breakout room. They're like, ah, I want to get out. Um, so I, I'm happy to uh, extend the period. So um, I, I'm going to, Seymour, is your hand up? Can you unmute? Yes, thank you, Tara. Sorry. Uh, just a short question. Uh, to go back to some of the uh, items you were talking about, could you define, help me define metaphysics? I find it a slippery definition. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, that, yeah. Well, I, I think that's great because as a philosophy major, um, that, you know, I still return to that. I think I Googled it today. <laughs> what is metaphysics? Um, I mean, if we think about the word, metaphysics. I, I mean, to me, it kind of it includes this idea that it is beyond the physical, beyond the sensible. It's an attempt to think of causes, um, systems, um, origins of patterns of thought. So I, I'm curious, does anyone else want to jump in with a working definition of metaphysics? please? Because that's a great, great question. And I'd love, um, Rob, Robert. Yeah, uh, formally, it uh, means beyond the physics, I think from Aristotle, but for a working definition, I think it refers to uh, uh, ontology and, um, and the question of knowledge. But maybe that's not good enough. <laughs> I think it commonly commonly thought metaphysics is you know something that's beyond our kind of normal physical life and it's way up in the abstractions yeah and i thank you bob and i also saw robert mckay i think had his hand up can you unmute uh, first of all Tarek. Can you understand me? I think my sound system is pretty bad. It's pretty scratchy. Okay, so I'll back off then. Can you type it in the chat? <laughs> does, does anyone else um, want to, uh, okay, let me see. Richard Poult. Yeah, hi, I'll comment a little bit, even though I'm new to this group, but I'm a Heidegger scholar and we all know there was a close con connection between. Welcome, Heidegger we're so glad to have you here, thank you. Thank you, yeah, I'm delighted to be here. I'm teaching a, a course on Arendt right now, so I was happy to discover this group, um, though I'm not an Arendt expert. So, so Heidegger has a lecture called What is Metaphysics? He has a lecture course called Introduction to Metaphysics and in brief, it's very complicated. So as we heard originally, it was just an editorial term used by people arranging Aristotle's texts, meaning the stuff that comes after the physics, and we don't know what, what to do with it. <laughs> Aristotle himself called it the study of being qua being, in other words, what's common to everything that is just by the fact that it is. Um, and then, or you could also call it the study of the first principles and causes of everything that is. And then Heidegger, among others, um, critiques the way this, this tradition has evolved. To make a long story short, it's been confused with the study of the supreme being, God, or some other sort of like paradigmatic being. And then it's also gotten mixed up with the Platonic distinction between those, those two worlds of the, the perceptible and the intelligible. And then metaphysics comes to mean what it means today if you look at the metaphysics section of a bookstore, you know, wacky new age stuff about invisible things. Um, so I guess I take a rent to be um, pointing out, among other things, that the, that whole dualism has become unbelievable, right? Quote, God is dead, in other words, as a way of thinking that there is this invisible, insensible world and that the job of the thinker is to somehow transcend the, the sensible. Thank you so much. That is really helpful. And, th and that is also kind of my 
um, sort of, I'm trying to understand metaphysics through Arendt and, and, you know, right away she says that it has more to do with poetry, right? That, that, um, that it's, that it's in these sort of elaborate attempts to at least remove from the sensible, approach the intelligible or the immortal, um, that she sees that ultimately as, as evidence of the striving for meaning, I think, or, and that these become uh, the, these, this, these apparatus that are, are the best examples we have of that urge of the thinker trying to make meaning, which has sort of erroneously been interpreted as some, or received, or as exactly um, as, as something that approaches God or, or something like that, I think. I mean, she's, you know, she, she wants to recoup this thinking, but she wants to rethink thinking and use them as a resource, I think, if I understand. Um, but thank you so much. I see John Stern has, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, I'm not a uh, philosophy student or, at all. My career was in the world of finance. So um, I've always approached the term of metaphysics by breaking it down into, into the meanings of each part. Meta being either change or beyond, and physics being the physical aspect of whatever. So metaphysics for me has always been beyond the physical, um, which would take you into a whole range of areas, but in this context, are uh, thinking, whatever thinking means. But that's how I've used, I've always used the term uh, of metaphor or understood the term of metaphysics. Thank you. I think that's really helpful. And I, I, I mean, it, it, that includes a lot of the, I think the orientation we've all been kind of um, trying to apply to it, uh, trying to break down the pieces of the words. Does anyone else want to sort of jump in with a question or an understanding of, of this key term? Okay. Oh, Ken. Hi, Ken, please. Hi. Well, everything that we've defined, uh, every, when we define metaphysics, it seems like almost exactly what Arendt is trying not to do, which is to reduce it to something beyond that she really wants to rest our understanding of thinking in the process of thinking and willing in the process of willing and judging in the process and not to say that there's this sort of essence or the beyond to all of this. So it's in between all these things that we're finding her conception, but not in a some removed beyond that unites everything. Yeah, that's really that's really helpful. I mean, I, I again, this is precisely I think her point is that the um well I thought one way I, I this may seem a little tangential, but when I was rereading the section on metaphor. Um, this is in section two, right? And, and she's talking about how metaphor is that sort of quality of thinking that allows us to connect the sensible to the invisible. And that that is sort of, she, can, she, she considers metaphor a gift of thinking, right? It, it, it's a, a gift of thought. Um, that, that it, and, it, and I think that sort of in between that it bridges those two things. And I think in a way it, it, it speaks to what you're saying, Ken, that it, it removes the, that we, we can talk about thinking precisely by referring to the sensible world, by connecting across it. We don't have to think of it as something transcendent. Um, and, and she's trying to do it without killing it. So like that when she talks about science in the beginning, the problem is that she, we can talk about thought with science, we can talk about the will, but we can't talk about the process of it. So the examples she brings up from science are, she talks about the roots or the organs. And I think the reason she brings those up is because I can tell you what your organs look like and what my organs look like, but I have to kill you and me to see them. And I think she means that like almost literally, like we're trying to discuss thinking 
without killing it, without analyzing it to death, or the roots, same thing with the roots. And she's also saying that if we find that my kidneys look like yours, it really doesn't tell us about much about us. And so she's trying to stick to like the richness of all this. And I also think she's trying to share her perplexities with us. I think she's bringing us along with her perplexities. So she doesn't have this, when I feel puzzled, I also feel like, well, I'm in this rich journey with her and it's, I'm not supposed to have answers. And it's not like she's hiding something. It's like she's taking us along and in that way of saying, we're not gonna get to the roots or the organs or the science of this, or I think even the metaphysics of this, but we're gonna have this very rich reading like you're talking about through metaphor, through storytelling. Okay. Thank you, that's great. Um, okay, I, I'm gonna now I'm, I, zoom you out into spontaneous small groups. Um, I understand that for some of you, this may not, not be the preference. I'm hoping enough people who are interested will end up in a group together. Um, what amount of time do you think you would like? Like 15? 15. 15? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to do 15 minutes. Um, and if it's not your thing, if you can just hang on and then you'll get zoomed right back into the larger group because um, we don't want to lose you. All right, here I go. Don't get scared. There's going to be a minute where you're nowhere. Um, Sorry. Okay. Here we go. One more, wait, give me one more second. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'm really doing it now. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Hi. We may be a group, almost, almost a small group. So, um, I'm saying hello to whoever's in my group and wants to participate. Rosemary, are you there? I'm here, but I'm just a I'm just a lurker. I haven't okay. I haven't even joined. I haven't even joined this group since July. Okay, well we'll be back to the main group soon. Uh, Sheila or Elisa, anyone? I'm waiting for the larger group. Okay, that's fine. Thank you.
Hi there.
Okay, I think everyone is slowly returning to our to our to our rooms. Okay, yeah, Jason says, and we're back. No one, no one is left lingering somewhere out in the stratosphere. Um, so I, I hope that that was um, like productive and interesting. And I guess I would now like to invite you know the groups to come together, and people can raise questions. You can also report back on topics that you covered in your group that you want to bring to the larger group, specifics about the text, just more of an open um, conversation at this point. So to do that, you can you can raise your hand. And um, as long as it doesn't get too crazy in here, I would love to just let people jump in as long as we are um, respectful, you can raise your hand, I'll call on you, but if you also feel an urge to respond to someone, you can kind of, you know, just sort of jump in and, and, and get your voice in there and I'll, I'll try to keep it calm. Um, so would anyone like to either share what they talked about or raise a question? Well, I'll jump in because one question was raised in our group. Do you have to sense before you can think. And one person said no, but I think yes, but I would be interested to hear. Do you have to sense in order to think? Any, anyone wanna weigh in on that in your reading of a rent? Carol would yeah, say Susan's uh, question. Uh, oh, well, there we all are. <laughs> Was the question, do you have to sense? Say the question again, Susan or Tara. Do you, um, can you, do you have to sense things before you can think something? The so sensing precedes thinking. Thank you. To me, that's, that's some of the points Arendt makes, at least as I read her course, it's, th this is the focus on appearances and that, that it comes from the world of appearances and that it's a world that we have, we, our impression is by our senses. And in one way, we might not know if we could think if we not, if we couldn't sense, because have we, I mean, have any of us ever, <laughs> I mean, we have all sensed before we thought, haven't we? I don't know, that's, that's my point on that. Aren't, aren't we de, aren't we defined as sentient sentient beings? So, I mean, already we're starting off. We can think now because we're sentient beings. That's one of the assumptions, I guess, of thinking, of being able to think. You're a sentient being. Uh, Jason, I think, just wrote that we covered this in our subgroup. And it reads strongly that there is nothing to think about until there is something that sparks a thought. Thoughts can spark thoughts, but something has to occur to us. Um, I would, I actually just, give me one second. I did just find um, a kind of quote that, that speaks directly to this, which is, I mean, she, I think according, according to Arendt, um, yes, we must sense before we can think. I, I, that's my, my understanding that, and this is her, um, I think that this is her taking to task of Descartes, right? That the mind has to have um, objects to think about. And this is when she gets into a more detailed um, explanation of imagination. This is on page 77. Um, I think we've gone over this before, but I guess it, it's worth repeating. This is the middle of the paragraph. Hence, the thought object is different from the image 
as the image is different from the visible sense object whose mere representation it is. It is because of this twofold transformation that thinking in fact goes even further beyond the realm of all possible imagination. Imagination, if you skip the quote, therefore, which transforms a visible object into an invisible image, fit to be stored in the mind is the condition sin qua non for providing the mind with suitable thought objects. But these thought objects come into being only when the mind actively and deliberately remembers, recollects, and selects from the storehouse of memory whatever arouses its interest sufficiently to induce concentration. In these operations, the mind learns how to deal with things that are absent and prepares itself to go further toward the understanding of things that are always absent, that cannot be remembered because they were never present to sense experience. So that doesn't quite answer it, but I would, she does go through this um, section where she's saying Descartes would not know he was thinking in his experiment. And she makes the case again and again that we only know we're thinking when we're thinking. So that, that when, when thinking stops, we can't have a purchase on thinking, um, which is part of the sort of ceaseless activity of it. Um, and I don't know the exact, oh, the page I just read from, that was from page 77. Thanks. Um, so I, I, I agree with Vigdis and, and others that this is part of her project is, is to insist that while the mind has to withdraw from the sensory, that that's its sort of unique and almost paradoxical quality, right? That it has to withdraw and then make objects available to it. I don't know, does someone else wanna weigh in on this? I, I, I think we have some philosophical minds in here that can, uh, sorry, uh, um, sorry there. Don't 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 you have a thought when you can put something into language into words? Isn't that when you have a thought? I mean, otherwise there's there's idea there's thoughts going through our mind all the time. They're spinning all day long, as we all know, and we don't act on them. We just let them go. But when we when our thoughts are actual thoughts, when we're thinking, it's put into words. It's put into language. And that gives it a, that becomes a thought, that becomes a think, you're thinking when you, you can put it in the language. There's an idea. In, yeah, a certain, anyone, in a certain sense, the question, although very interesting, can't really be answered because the only way you could answer it is, as he said, with language and with a, a repertoire of senses to, to give it meaning. So whether we think without sensing or we don't is kind of a hard question to answer. What would it look like, for example? I mean, uh, if we thought without a uh, backdrop of sensing, what would that be? Some kind of digital phenomenon or, you know, it would, it, it's, it's a puzzle. Well, it, can, I, can I try something here? Um, if you have two people, one being uh, one an English uh, English speaking, and another person who is another language, irrelevant what the language is, and we both put our hands on a hot piece of metal, do we sense before each of us thinks? Do we need even language? To, will we not both feel the same? And so does sensing at that point precede language? Um, so if I can jump in, here is a, a quote, and that's a great question. And I think one way to think about that is also the role of sort of emotion um, and, and soul and kind of reaction um, that there are external stimuli to which we react. Uh, part of what, what Arendt thinks distinguishes thinking is that, and I think some Buddhists would disagree with this, is that we choose the objects of our thought, right? That, that thinking is something that I, I, I choose to partake in and I can choose to stop it. Um, 
So on the page on page eighty seven, uh, the beginning of of the first uh, full paragraph, so more than halfway down the page, the page she says, "All thought arises out of experience, but no experience yields any meaning or even coherence without undergoing the operations." of imagining and thinking. Seen from the perspective of thinking, life in its sheer thereness is meaningless. Seen from the perspective of the immediacy of life and the world given to the senses, thinking is, as Plato indicated, a living death. So the, the, the point here um, for sure is that Again, this is her kind of problem or curiosity about the withdrawal necessary to think. Um, that um, all thinking emerges from, from sense experience. I mean, she says that pretty clearly there. Now we can become very removed from it. We can remember, we can read, live in language, um, combine, create. But that is, is still the kind of storehouse for, for thinking. We, but the whole point is that we can, we can detach. In fact, we are required, she calls it desensing, that in order to think about something, we have to desense it. We have to translate it from, and this is the language, John, that you're bringing up, and, and John, and I think Seymour too, that that it language is that bridge by which we, we, we kind of encode the world sort of in our minds. Um, and that's where metaphor is kind of a bridge, but it's a bridge, it's not one or the other. Um, so part of it is that thinking can actually bring, I mean, right now we can all like remember something right? And it is not present to us. That's, this is what she's fascinated by. Like, I'm, I'm remembering my fifth grade birthday party at Taco Bell. That actually happened, you know? Um, and where is that? Where, you know, she's like, where does that live? Now, that is what thinking can do. Um, unlike the hot stove, which, which, which uh, as an exterior impulse, right, I, I react to, I emote um, this. Her interest in thinking is partially that it, it has everything to do with sense information, and yet it is required to actually remove itself for the think, from thinking. And um, I wanted to ask you all what, what you thought about. Um, one of the things I found very interesting was her use of this word absent mindedness because she says, unlike thoughtlessness, absent-mindedness is, is almost paradoxically, again, the very indication of, of thinking, right? When someone appears absent-minded, what they really appear absent-minded to is, is, the, is the world immediately in front of them because they are kind of in their thoughts. Um, and so absent-mindedness, she says, is one of the only expressions of thinking that we have. Um, I wondered if anyone else either picked up on that or, or had, any, had any thoughts about that or other questions. I think it's interesting because it chimes with some uh, things that I've read more in the, I guess, the psychology area, saying that the kind of problem solving thinking so not maybe you know your kind of more trivial thoughts but where you're actually generating uh ideas for example does generally happen at something that could be described as absent-mindedness it's not like full consciousness on the problem and it's not full distractedness but kind of in between state um and i think that kind of works quite well with what you're saying about that absent-minded state as being a state of thinking. Yeah, it's like this removal. And then it's also almost like that, she says it's like constant motion, it's like a trance of some kind or constant activity. 
Um, other questions or topics? I think our group went into quite a different direction. Um, we, we did talk about how the text compares to other writings by Aaron and that it feels quite different. Um, yeah, and uh, if it helps us reflect on meaning. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe some others from the group want to add, add their impressions. Um, I don't know if anyone from Jenny's group wants to speak or Aldo, if you want to jump in. Hi. Hi, Tara. Uh, yeah, I... I... Wanted uh, if you could um, uh, deep a little about the relation uh, between the, the the will and, and the meaning uh, that it was touched some weeks ago. But um, I mean, part of the will is to build a, a meaning beyond the results of the will. Is you know if you could touch a little the, the subject. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if other people want to jump in in terms of talking about the will as well. I mean, it's interesting that um, it we haven't gotten fully through her her section uh, on the will, but it does get kind of folded in to um, other pieces of this text. And in one one page, I found really helpful was she's talking about how. Um, that sight is the sense that is most affiliated with thinking. Okay, that thinking happens in, in images. And then she, I mean, if we're talking about the faculties of thinking and then that um, judging is, we, we associate with the sense of taste, right? To have taste. It's the most intimate, the most um, kind of discriminating and personal. And then she says that Willing is most associated with desire as a kind of overarching um, force in uh, the, of kind of all the senses collected. Um, I don't know. I don't know where that leaves the bigger the bigger question. I mean, we've been thinking. I mean, I feel like we've arrived at these places with the will where there is this question of like, the will feels like it's at this borderline between almost anticipation, imagination and action, that, that willing seems to come closest to some sort of engagement and yet it's still a faculty of thought. I don't know if that's getting at your question, but that it's an open question for me. I'd be curious if other people have made any headway on this. Yeah, I'd like to say something about that and also make a comment on, on Mr. Stern's uh, comment. But first, I'll, I'll address it. We spoke about uh, there was one artist in the group. Uh, and uh, basically, I, I started reading a book about, you know, willing as more of a negative uh, means end type of thing. And I realized in, in this book, Arendt is, is really attacking the philosophers. And willing has the element of freedom in it. And she's really saying they're way at the, you know, the other side. But willing um, by, you know, just willing is kind of a medium way, an intermediate way to action. I don't think it's action itself, because uh, the book that we would uh, that I, I brought up is the what it means to be human. It's the case for the body, and it also relates to the uh, uh, our you know addressing um, set, you know uh, not just intellect but senses. It's the case for the body in public bioethics. It's by uh, an author named uh, Sneed S N E A D. Uh, he, unfortunately, he doesn't reference Arendt as much as Alistair McIntyre, but he thinks that you know as opposed to a means end thing, willing kind of gives me more of the impression of, okay, willing to do something. But his argument is that, you know, we always think of, uh, of freedom as willing, but it's more of a communitarian, and a Rentian sense would be a more of a communitarian way of getting ideas 
out there, okay, willing might be give us the impetus to for action, hence her criticism of, of the philosophers. Okay, so it has the element of freedom in it, but to get to the ultimate action, it has to be more of a communitarian approach, not just my will, your will, his will. Yeah. Just one quick comment on John's uh, comment. I don't think it's, you know, I, I'm reminded of the, uh, the miracle worker, right? Helen Keller, right? She felt a lot of things in the beginning of her life. She'd make crazy, you know, noises and stuff. But until she conceptualized language, wah wah, you know, for water, she really couldn't express it. So I don't think it's uh, the example of two people, uh, you know, feeling a hot stove uh, is not pre linguistic because if you didn't have language to start with, you really had no way of, of expressing it. So I think language is. I think I don't think it's because Helen Keller, you know, when she was feeling things before she really learned language, there was no way for her to express it uh, to other people besides grunts and, you know, making noises and stuff. But okay, that's all I have to say. <laughs> thank, thank you, Marty. I, I would say that, um, I mean, Arendt does allow for the fact that those grunts or that type of communication it is a type of communication and and she distinguishes it from language right and and she says that that thinking requires language we don't think in grunts like for for a rent that 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 humans could have a minimum amount of kind of she talks about gestures um you know reactions, communication of the body, that, that humans could get by um, in the way that animals do, meeting their needs, even collaborating in certain ways, but that it is thought that requires language in order to exist in a discursive realm, that that is, that is the unique quality of thinking. So, um, you know, she thinks of thought as, as we've all kind of mentioned, that it kind of flows, it's discursive, it happens in time. I mean, she does make the comparison actually to um, Chinese uh, language and pictograms, uh, that they, they are kind of engaged more in an image-based, um, they're not an alphabetic language. So I just want to point out, and again, I, I, I don't know exactly um, someone is asking, is there a shared definition of discursive? Uh, when I say discursive, I mean um, happening in language, coming from the word discourse. So relying on um, uh, the kind of temporal stringing together of words, that that is how I am communicating, not through gesture, not through image, but through words. Um, I think I saw Jane put that in the in, in the chat. So, um, and this is a word that that Arendt does use. So I, I do think it's interesting. And this is, again, another moment of, of Arendt's just really kind of nuanced um, quality of distinction in that she does say, sure, she even says about the passions, right, that the passions communicate on the body. Right, this is, this is different than thinking. And, and she links the passions to the soul, right? We have, when we feel shame, our cheeks redden. Um, if we're uh, threatened, we, we tense up. That the body itself has ways of expressing um, kind of the, the, the exterior stimuli or even emotions and passions. But that thought um, cannot happen unless language is available. I don't know if anyone else wants to, to jump in. Anne has raised her hand. Please. Uh, yes, I, I just wondered whether um, confining the, this idea of discourse or, <clears throat> or um, thought to verbal language then discounts the possibility that thinking and can occur, for example, in an activity like drawing or dancing, 
you know, in the in the arts that I mean, I've had a discussion with other artists around the, the, the passage that you mentioned earlier around the imagination and whether in the act of drawing you are you are making sense, you are making meaning. Uh, but there's an immediacy. It's it, the in drawing, for example, the notion of desensing becomes quite problematic because there's a simultaneity around the making meaning with the relationship of the senses and to the world. And I just wondered whether Arendt had ever nuanced her thinking and whether, in fact, when she talks about thinking, she is only talking about verbal language, whether other languages come into play. That's a great question. I wonder if there are other, I mean, James, this kind of goes to your question. And I wonder if there are other artists who write or writers who want to kind of speak to, to, to this. I just want to jump in and say she does talk about the Chinese language as a, the visibility, you know, the visual, visualness of it. So she does at least acknowledge that in that way. This is something I think we've tackled several times, um, this being the second reading of Life of the Mind. And the, the discussion in the past has revolved around the idea of developing meaning so that you actually are using your thinking to construct new possibilities. And I, I immediately jumped on that going, well, that's, that's what I do when I'm designing something. That's what I call design, really. You know, and I'm usually not doing it very verbally or not at all. I'm usually you know, just trying to sketch and pull ideas together by comparing ideas to ideas visually. But the process of that isn't really that different from the process of thinking. And the the big distinction, of course, being though that when I'm designing, I am trying to get to a result, whereas um, you know with thinking, you know the re results are not primary; they're not even secondary. Thinking is, through the definition of our end, is distinctly not result oriented. Sorry, can I jump in again? Uh, yes, yeah, so please. One would argue that many art forms are not result orientated, even in the moment of communication, even for, well, improvisation and music or improvisation and dance is really about a, an open ended exploration that's intended to be shared. It is, in a way, a kind of discourse. But, it is, but, but yeah. it's not a meaning generating. It doesn't generate meaning. It may generate emotions, but it doesn't actually come to uh, a greater understanding of meaning. Right. Um, <laughs> I think I would argue with that. First. But what's the meaning then? What is the meaning? If you can argue it, then you could say, what is the meaning? But you have to think about it. You have to put it into words. We default back to language and we have to explain ourselves. And therefore, that's how we generate meaning is when we can actually communicate it. What I was talking about before, uh, I think the body is import, uh, extremely important. Okay, But my only point was that you first have to have language and then the body definitely influences decisions, not just the intellect. And Anne's point, I think you can describe. Art critics describe it or do it all the time. They, they put meaning to art by, by criticizing the art and, and evaluating it. It's not just, the, and the same thing with music. It, it's not just, you know, what the musician felt or the artist felt. It's its effect on the public world and how we react to it. And that provides a lot of meaning. 
if I could just point us to one section that I, I recently reread, but not very carefully, um, but to, to speak to some of these pieces where um, Arendt talks about the spectator, right? The spectator who has to, who observes the theater or the, the spectator who's not the art maker is not the actor. Um, and that the spectator does have a role, I feel like it's similar to what Jason is saying a little bit about ultimately to convey meaning. Um, I guess each spectator at an event who can see the whole thing, right? Who isn't the maker, but is the watcher makes meaning out of that. Yeah, good, um, point. good point, Tara, I, I agree. I agree with that. But, I just wanted to also add this quote just to ground us in, this is at the bottom of page 49. And it, it, it removes the discursive quality. This is this um, about art. So this paragraph, although everything that appears is perceived in the mode of it seems to me, hence open to error and illusion. Appearance as such carries with it a prior indication of realness. So this is just a re re reiteration of we are beings in the world who perceive things sometimes inaccurately, but there's a there-ness and a realness. All sense experiences are normally accompanied by the additional, if usually mute, sensation of reality. And this despite the fact that none of our senses taken in isolation and no sense object taken out of context can produce it. Art, therefore, which transforms sense objects into thought things, tears them first of all out of their context in order to derealize and thus prepare them for their new and different function. So, I'm just throwing that out there as another moment where I think there is a, a gap, um, you know, trying to really think about how how she's she's offering us a way to think about creation and, and making art. Um, I don't think that every quote kind of lines up exactly. I think it has something to do with the spectator making meaning. Um, she says something else about art not being expressive. So um, I just want to throw that in the mix as a place to go to where for her art requires becoming a thought thing, but not, now she doesn't say language. She says a thought thing. Um, I'm seeing Ken's, Ken, did you want to jump in on that? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that there's lots of ways to make meaning, but they're not necessarily thinking. And art, I think for her, art is one of those things. It's definitely, we can't argue that it's making meaning. But I think like there's plenty of artists who have also confronted that. Like John Cage basically says that making art and critiquing it are two separate acts and they happen at separate times. And when she's talking about thinking and you brought up the critic, um, Tara, that I think the critic is reflecting. It's looking back on something that's being made. And her idea of thinking is always has to do with the past, has to do with remembrance, it has to do with thought things, it has to do with language. So that act that you're talking about, Anne, of creating a drawing or creating meaning is forward moving, it has to do with willing, it has to do with other with action. And I think she's separating that from the life of the mind in order for us to uh, view it, to think about it in the same way that John Cage was to say that that act of creating meaning is uh, not the same as as thinking for her. And there's other ways of creating meaning too. Like Eichmann had plenty of meaning. He wasn't thinking about it. His meaning was from others. Um, uh, uh, Tara, I was just wondering if, um, you see at the very bottom of, of page 49 that you read, uh, you there's a, Part of her writing is in uh, brackets, eh? Art, therefore, which transforms sense object in, into thought things, tears them first of all, of all out of their context in order to derealize and thus prepare them for their new and different function. I take that that as humans, 
we have the capacity for abstract thought. That's, that's, that's what I think she's kind of saying there. And that goes for later on. Once you have the capacity for abstract thought, then you can put that into some type of language and maybe create meaning. But it's the, abs the fact we have abstract thought. Monkeys would be watchmakers if they ever had the notion of time. We have, we can figure, we have time. We could figure time. It's, we can calculate. We can, we can abstract and this notion about movement called time, but monkeys can't do that. Even though they're tool makers, they're, they, they were able to make tools, fashion tools. They can't do that. We can do that. And that's, I think, partly what she's saying there. Thank you. So, and she says uh, also, but this is from human conditions. She, she says that the expressionism is a contradiction in terms, in her view. It's not art. It's actually what she considers, and I know Roger did, did said, a lot of artists gets angry when he comes to this part of Hannah Arendt, but that's what she says, at, at least. And it's because expressionist, it has something to do, I think, with what she defines as a soul, the emotion. And then by that, it has not, it's not gone through thinking. So, so I think that that makes a difference. And uh, at least on her view, I, I don't want to say anything, <laughs> but her view, I think, is in that line. Uh, thank you. That's really, this is really helpful. I mean, I, I find in general um, that the question of art in a rent is a very productive place to think because it, it seems to hit against all of these limits and categories. And so, um, you know, I, I thought about really trying to like find time or find a place to kind of really think through a rent through that lens, because I feel like it's, it's one that's quite relatable, um, meaningful. Uh, so I just want to bracket that, that I, I feel like when we, that this group has at, at a few different times gravitated around this question of creation and art and expression. Um, and, and just to mark that as that there's something there, I think, when when you but she she calls it bumps in the road of thinking that that there's something protect, potentially like generative about thinking through her thinking about art. Not that we're necessarily going to agree with every part of it, but um, you kind of tracking. And I I know many people on here, including Jason, have done this pretty um, extensively. I, I I mean I think we're going to wrap up soon. I I also just wanted to to kind of reflect back to you all. I mean, I feel like with this text, maybe more than, than others, or at least in the chat last week, there was some sense of like, why is Arendt writing this? Like, and, and, and that that question is the very question of meaning, right? Like, like we wanna know what, like why this book, right? You know, um, and I, I, I just think it's it, that, it, that it's almost when you come up against, like she says, like those obstacles of thought, like that this book seems a little less, um, also it's cobbled together and it's from incomplete speeches and stuff, but this project of hers to really map out thinking, um, that, that, you know, it, 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 at least for me, it tugs at this question. I keep trying to get back to it. Why, why does this matter? And again, that's why kind of circling back that I, I, I go back to her sense of Eichmann that somehow, you know, the thinking capacity, which she insists is not the domain of the elite or the few, but that we must demand from all, if in fact it is related to our ability to judge right and wrong, right? That, that she's seeing that there's actually a lot at stake there in terms of conduct in the world, but also just in, the very experience of, of being alive. And so I think carrying over from the human condition, remember she bracketed thought out of the human condition because she so wanted to be like, look, action has been demoted 
Um, let's break it up. Let's let me show you how diverse it is and 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 how you know it it is the basis of our political life. But you know, she says and that this is sort of the second impetus for the book that she started doubting her, the ending of the human condition. She started wondering, you know, she throws in that quote from I guess it's Cicero that's designated to Cato. We are never more active um when we are thinking right and i mean what a i don't know about you but when i read the end of that book i was like what you just undid the whole thing <laughs> so this is she says in the intro like this was me like owning up to the fact that i kind of left this big trap door like that thinking is the human condition as well um that that it is the very, you know, she makes these metaphors of the wind and the breath, that, that this quality, um, you can live without it, but she's pretty much saying you're not human, at least. So I, I, I feel like trying to come to grasp with like the stakes of this book as not just like a philosophical exercise, but really as having some urgency for her it is difficult, but important. Um, and so that's kind of when I keep circling back to that intro, I'm like, okay, what is, you know, what is she pursuing here? So, um, I think we can, I, I want to invite anyone who has like a final question or comment, um, to please get their voice in the mix today or else, you know, we'll probably wind down soon. I might just say one thing. I was thinking to say it when you were talking about difference between willing and thinking, because I just since I liked it very much, and it's on page forty-two on willing, and it's the last sentence on this first paragraph where she writes, and the whole page until that is very nice as well. But she writes from the view point of thinking, the thinking ego, old age in Heidegger's world is the time of meditation, or in the words of Sophocles, it's the time of peace and freedom, released from bondage, not only to the passions of the body, but to the all-consuming passion of the mind, the mind inflicts on the soul, the passion of the will called ambition. And I, <laughs> I like it very much since I'm, I mean, being past 60 and I, I feel this it's more it's the relaxing that comes into and you can relax into this thinking and I mean life for the mind is the last work the last thing Arendt worked on and she wanted to relax as she from the biography of her she wanted but she was drawn back to what all the things that happened she couldn't stay out of but yes but it has something, it's the connection between willing and ambition, I think. Thank you, Vigdis, wonderful. Beatrice? Oh, okay, may I jump in just on that, uh, that uh, what reconciled me to this whole part two on, on um, willing, because boy, it's not an easy read, uh, but I have to say that it's a little bit in contrast to what was just said, although I do agree with that part too, I do like that. But on page 37, 38, um, she talks about the two functions, really. And she says at the bottom of page 37, remembrance may affect the soul with longing for the past, but this nostalgia, while it may hold grief and sorrow, does not upset the mind's equanimity because it concerns things which are beyond our power to change. Now that struck me. And then, and then she goes on to say, on the contrary, the willing ego, looking forward and backward, deals with things which are in our power but whose accomplishment is by no means certain. And then she concludes by saying the tension between these two, and I find it an exciting, it's an interesting one. Uh, the tension can be 
uh, overcome only by doing, that is by giving up the mental activity altogether. So, so I found this exciting because as I was reading Willing, I was so, I had convinced myself that really I just love the world of thinking. But uh, now, now she's, I'm somewhat reconciled. So these, these various patch, passages are, are intriguing, I think. Can I just jump in for one second? Because um, I love that, that quote, Beatrice, but she does say, uh, the willing ego looking forward and not backward. And not backward? And not backward. Only forward. Thanks. That's why we ha always have to read it at least twice, don't we? Um, thank you. I feel like this is a wonderful trajectory to land on since it, it gets us back directed towards the will, which we're going to be reading more of for, for next week with Roger. So, um, I, I just want to thank everyone for uh, st sticking around and, and trying out a different kind of conversational format. I, I really enjoyed it and I appreciated everybody's attention and contribution so much. Um, and I definitely look forward to, to continuing to read with you next, next week. So I, I, I think we're, we're continuing with uh, part two of, of, the, of the will. And you'll get the regular email for that. So unless there's any questions or concerns, I think we'll, we'll finish up then. Thank yeah? you, Tara. Okay. Thank you. Thank everybody. you all. Thank you so much.